John Taffer has seen it all. From bars barely hanging onto kitchens, so filthy they could double as biohazard zones. And even owners more clueless than their customers. But there are some bars that push John past his breaking point. Moments where his frustration boiled over, and the man known for his fiery temper truly lost it. Daddy, eat this frickin' food! Respectful son of a bitch! Don't touch me! This might be the worst kitchen I've ever seen. It's it! Oh my god. Get the f out of here! Get the f out of here! This is unbelievable! You see, John Taffer's seen some horror shows in his time, but Fairways Golf Bar and Grill in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, this one was in a league of its own. It wasn't just the dirty kitchen or the struggling staff, no. This was a masterclass in sheer neglect and mind-boggling incompetence that pushed John right to the edge. If you were watching this unfold on TV, you might have had to put down your dinner because the scene was enough to make anyone's stomach churn. When John first walked into Fairways, the writing was on the wall. Richard Jordan, the owner, had sunk $150,000 into debt, and his $40,000 golf simulator was about as profitable as a broken ATM. Instead of managing his bar, Richard left it in the hands of his assistant manager, Michelle. But here's the kicker, he micromanaged her so badly that nothing got done right. And then there was Kevin, the so-called chef, whose idea of cleanliness was so far off the mark that it's a miracle anyone survived a meal there. James, the other cook, knew the reality. He knew the place was filthy, but he was powerless to do anything because Kevin couldn't care less. And Richard, he was in complete denial, claiming the ambiance and food were excellent. Enter John Taffer, rolling up in his SUV with health inspector Steve Blovet, ready to tackle what was already shaping up to be one of the worst situations they'd ever encountered. John had seen some bad kitchens in his day, but this one was something else. You could practically feel the grime as they walked in. John sent in his undercover experts, Brian and Phil, a renowned culinary artist and mixologist, to order everything on the menu. Just seeing the order slip was enough to send Kevin into a full-blown freakout, a big red flag if ever there was one. And it only got worse from there. Count the health violations with me, okay? First off, Kevin touched raw ingredients, and then everything else without so much as a hand wash. Gloves were apparently an alien concept in this kitchen. Then, with those same filthy hands, he started making a pizza. Meanwhile, John and Steve noticed a crusty old bowl that looked like it had time traveled from the past, and Kevin used it to cover food. Oh, look at that. That bowl has not been cleaned since this place opened. The pea drop. Oh. Over at the bar, Michelle poured drinks, but when asked for a beer, the keg was kicked. She handed Phil a glass with just a few sips of beer, and one taste was all it took. Phil's stomach rebelled immediately. He threw up hard. Turns out, the beer was expired, tasting like metal and misery. It had probably been sitting there for a year, going bad like everything else in this place. After 29 long minutes, the food finally started coming out, and it was as bad as the beer. Phil's stomach was already in revolt, and he had to rush to the bathroom to throw up. Imagine that, one sip and he was done. Steve, who's been in the business for 14 years, said he'd never seen anything this gross or anyone get sick so fast. Oh my god, he threw up! When Richard found out Phil threw up, he brushed it off, saying maybe the sauces didn't agree with him because Kevin was a great cook. Yeah, right. John, watching all of this, was fuming. He hadn't even stepped foot in the bar yet, but he'd already decided it needed to be shut down. The smell hit him the moment he opened the door, a foul mix of rot and neglect. Richard claimed his kitchen staff were overwhelmed by orders, but John wasn't having it. They could have killed Phil with that beer, and not even the food. John's anger reached a boiling point when he asked Richard to drink the same beer they served Phil. And of course, Richard refused. John picked up the glass and smashed it on the floor in a rage. Then Brian dropped the bombshell. Those mushrooms Kevin served, they still had dirt on them. We're up to six health violations now, if you're counting. 
John and his team stormed into the kitchen, only to find Kevin proudly claiming he graduated from culinary school. They made him taste the sauce he'd served, and even Kevin recoiled. It was bubbling because bacteria had taken over. It's bubbling because the bacteria has grown so far. The grease in the kitchen was so thick it looked like it hadn't been cleaned in three years. Kevin, still in denial, insisted he cleaned it daily. Brian scraped out a chunk of grease from under the fryer that was so thick it could have been a meal on its own. But the final straw? Raw chicken, sitting out at room temperature, was clocking in at a hazardous 57 degrees. 0.7 degrees. Throw it out! Good job, chef! You'd think that would be the end of it, but no. John and his team headed into the walk-in, which Kevin claimed had no mold. The second they stepped inside, the stench hit them. Mold was everywhere. On the floors, ceilings, light fixtures. And it wasn't just any mold. It was toxic black mold, the kind that can kill you. And if that wasn't bad enough, there were mushrooms growing out of the walls. No way! This is a board. Oh, dude, you got mushrooms growing in the wall. John had enough. He pushed everyone out of the kitchen. It was too dangerous to stay. Furious, he walked out of the bar throwing the food they served to the ground. This was beyond saving, and John wasn't about to risk anyone's life over it. Oh! This isn't healthy for you! Let's get out of here! Get out of here! Next up, we have the Brick Tavern, a clueless owner, a bartender who couldn't mix a basic drink, and expired meat in the kitchen. This place was a cocktail of chaos with a side of health violations. If there was ever a bar that could make John lose it, this was it. I've never seen it. it. Looks like chicken blood in there. What the hell is that? Say N8. N8. Oh my god. What is That's it? five weeks ago. Yeah. So what is that? Is that protein? It looked like some kind of meat. John Taffer strode into the brick tavern, and what he uncovered was a disaster zone of epic proportions. It wasn't just a failing bar, it was a ticking time bomb of mismanagement, bad decisions, and kitchen chaos waiting to explode. Charlene Winter, a real estate agent who had once been the queen of property deals, had decided to trade her lucrative career for the bar business. What was supposed to be her retirement dream had quickly turned into a nightmare. After nine years of winging it, Charlene was now drowning in a staggering $500,000 debt. John Taffer wasn't about to tiptoe around this catastrophe. He arrived with expert griller Kevin Bloodsoe, ready to dive into the mess. From his vantage point, it was clear that the Brick Tavern was a sinking ship. The staff operated like they were in some kind of Wild West showdown, with zero management or leadership in sight. Charlene? She was out of her depth, clueless about how to rein in the chaos. She'd hired Cassie as a personal assistant, but Cassie was stuck in an unofficial management role that clearly wasn't working out. It was like trying to patch a leaky boat with duct tape. Four, four, Why do three. I have? That's, that's tough. It doesn't matter. You're my assistant. You need to do it, ma'am. To get the full scoop, John sent in two local radio personalities for a bit of undercover reconnaissance. And, oh boy, did they get more than they bargained for. Basic drinks? Forget it. The Brick Tavern didn't even stock ginger beer or butter. When the bartender finally managed to cobble something together, it was so overpowering that it gave one of the radio hosts an instant headache. Now, that's what you call a cocktail catastrophe. Ooh. That's a sour. Yeah, that's too strong for me. I think I just got an like, instant headache. But things really hit rock bottom when John turned his attention to the kitchen. Charlene, Cassie, and Tyler, the cook, were locked in a ridiculous argument over beer while serving up undercooked meat. And if that wasn't enough, John's blood pressure skyrocketed when he discovered expired mystery meat in the kitchen. We're talking about chicken that had been sitting around for five weeks. Yes, five weeks of culinary neglect, and they were ready to serve it up. John couldn't take it any longer. He stormed into the kitchen and shut down service on the spot. Weeks old, and you're gonna sell it to someone? Are you crazy? As if the situation couldn't get any worse, John found even more expired meat, some dating back months. Charlene stood there, clueless and nonchalant, while John's patience was fraying at the edges. 
When he sarcastically suggested she eat the old chicken herself, Charlene just laughed it off. It was like watching a bad sitcom where no one seemed to get the gravity of the situation. I want you to eat it. Oh, now I'm not eating it. This is funny to you? No, it's not funny. Charlene's so-called management skills? Let's just say they were non-existent. She couldn't even mop the floors properly, let alone manage a bar in freefall. John's frustration boiled over when he discovered fries that were practically swimming in what looked like chicken blood. He lost it, kicking the bucket of fries and delivering an ultimatum. Either clean up this disaster or say goodbye to the bar. What the hell is that? Uh, I don't know. Listen to me. I want you to clean up your kitchen, do what you need to do. I don't want you to touch this. You are cleaning that. John's showdown with the Brick Tavern was a whirlwind of frustration and chaos. The bar wasn't just on life support, it was in critical condition. With expired meat, a clueless owner, and a staff running wild, the situation was beyond salvageable unless drastic action was taken. John left Charlene with a clear choice, clean up the mess or face the consequences. It was time for her to either step up or step out because the Brick Tavern couldn't afford any more half-baked solutions. Moving on to the Sacktown Sports Bar and Grill, where the concept of a sports bar is hanging by a thread. What should have been a lively spot packed with fans and energy had turned into a deserted, run-down joint that couldn't even get the basics right. Your failure, not theirs. Buy their frickin' dinner. Let's make it again. Make a new one. It's boosted, man. When John Taffer strolled into Sacktown Sports Bar and Grill, it felt like stepping into a living nightmare, only without the nightmares ever ending. Chris Eaton, a retired cop turned bar owner, had dreams of a sports shrine, but ended up with a disaster zone. His vision of sports glory had crashed and burned faster than a football team without a quarterback. John, ever the master of undercover cops, teamed up with Grammy-winning artist T-Pain for a covert mission. They slipped into the bar unnoticed, and boy, did they pick a doozy of a night. The bar, sprawling over a whopping 9,600 square feet, looked like a massive space, perfect for a party or a major cleanup. John and T-Pain tried to blend in, but the bar's issues were so glaring they could have been spotted from space. The evening took a nosedive when John and T-Pain watched Ricardo, the cook, lose his cool and hurl a grilled cheese sandwich against the wall. Talk about a meltdown. It was like watching someone throw a tantrum in a toddler's playpen, except in this case, the sandwich was the unfortunate casualty. Undeterred, John and T-Pain placed their order, New York strip steak, French dip, and a couple of the bar's specialty cocktails. The drinks came, and if you were looking for a headache in a glass, congratulations, you found it. They were so strong. One sip had T-Pain contemplating a career in non-alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, man. The steaks? Well, let's just say they were closer to the rare side of rare and left a lot to be desired. The wings? Oh, they were so undercooked, they might as well have been served with a side of rubber bands. Over at another table, a lady had a chicken pesto panini that looked like it had been through a soggy sock factory. John called for Ricardo, the kitchen manager, and asked him if he'd like to eat the raw food being served. Shockingly, Ricardo declines. Well, when your own kitchen manager doesn't want to touch the food, you know you're in trouble. Chris, the bar's owner, was oblivious to the mess until John made a grand entrance. Chris was standing right at the entrance, and yet somehow, he didn't see John coming in. John's entrance was less of a surprise and more a wake-up call. With $450,000 in debt and bleeding $8,000 a month, Chris's sports bar dream was rapidly turning into a sports bar disaster. John laid it out straight. Sacramento wasn't exactly a sports town, and Chris's stubbornness about keeping the sports theme was more absurd than a football team trying to play soccer. That Sacramento is not a sports town compared to other markets. I would disagree respectfully because I grew up here. John had officially hit his breaking point. He shot up from his seat, eyes scanning the room for his next target. Spotted a poor woman at another table attempting to choke down a sandwich that, honestly, 
looked more like a piece of leather than anything remotely edible. With frustration bubbling over, John pointed her out and didn't stop there. Look at that sandwich, you're fighting with that thing, it's like a piece of leather. He made his way to table after table, asking diners if they even wanted to pay for the food they'd been served. And obviously they didn't. Not one person had anything good to say about their meals. It was all horrendous. Hey, so should she eat this? No! Top the table! Let's move on down here! Rage was palpable. John, in a full fury, grabbed a plate and smashed it on the table. The sound echoed through the bar, but John wasn't done. He stormed to yet another table and did the same thing. Crashed, another plate shattered. It was like a mini earthquake of rage in Sacktown. Each plate dropped louder than the last. The message was clear. This food was bad, bad, bad all the way through. Not a single decent bite in the house. Not good, so look at this one. Let's cop this one too. You're gonna cop every one of these meals. Finally, John turned to Chris and made it plain as day. This mess was on him, not the customers. The bar was failing because Chris was failing. No one, John declared, was going to pay for their meals today. With that, John stormed out of the bar, leaving behind a wake of broken plates, shocked diners, and one clueless owner. Hold your hats for this one, because John Taffer's visit to Jazz Cats in Southfield, Michigan, quickly escalated into a full-blown showdown between him and a defiant bartender. What started as a mission to save a failing jazz club turned into an intense clash, with John going head-to-head -head with an out-of-control bartender who refused to take orders and nearly turned violent. Now, you don't have the personality to actually run it. And you think you do? I know. When John Taffer stepped into Jazz Cats in Southfield, Michigan, it was clear from the start that this was not going to be a smooth ride. The Jazz Club, owned by psychologist Dr. Tamika Scott, was more of a chaotic mess than a smooth, soulful haven. Tamika had opened the club back in 2014, confident that jazz music was therapy. But the reality of running a business was far from the dream. Her idea to mix jazz with cocktails seemed great on paper, but things had spiraled out of control quickly. Initially, jazz cats thrived, pulling in $30,000 a month. Tamika was riding high, but then came the classic mistake, hiring friends instead of qualified staff. The business began to nosedive. Quality dropped, customers disappeared, and now, Tamika found herself hemorrhaging $8,000 a month, just weeks away from closing. Adding fuel to the fire, she couldn't get along with her co-managers, who just so happened to be her parents. The whole operation was like a dysfunctional family reunion that nobody wanted to attend. The main issue at Jazz Cats was that Tamika hired unprofessional staff and refused to listen to her mother, Karen. Their frequent arguments were fueled by Karen's belief that Tamika was too lenient with the staff and couldn't manage them effectively. Meanwhile, Karen herself was rude and overly controlling, which only worsened the tension between them. John, along with expert mixologist Phil Wills and chef Anthony Lamas, did a reconnaissance mission to check out the bar. From the outside, Jazz Cats was bland, no real signage to draw anyone in just a lonely logo with no real hook. They quickly realized that while jazz might be therapeutic, it wasn't exactly packing the place. Plus, inside the club, it was a circus. This area needs to be swept. It's not swept. Working with a bunch of babies up in here, sheep. The main issue was the bartender, Dre, refusing to make drinks because no one knew how to make half the cocktails on their own menu. How does a bartender just say no to making drinks? If that wasn't bad enough, Dre took it to another level by arguing with customers and even picking fights over simple complaints. When John sent in jazz bassist Robert Hurst and his friend to test the waters, it was a complete disaster. Dre just ignored them, even though he was only four feet away, refusing to acknowledge their presence as they kept calling for service. When they finally got their drinks, they were a mess too strong or too sweet, and to top it off, Dre made them in the sink with his back to the guests.
the whole place was a mess. Customers were waiting over 40 minutes for their drinks, while Dre the bartender was completely oblivious. Drinks were constantly being sent back because they were undrinkable. Finally, a frustrated customer walked up to the bar, complaining he'd been standing there for five minutes and Dre hadn't even taken his order. But instead of apologizing, Dre denied seeing him, which only fueled the customer's anger. Dre, ever the professional, took offense and started instigating the guy, pushing things until he finally lost his temper. It got so bad that Dre charged at the customer, and John had to step in before things turned violent. Go in, guys. We, we can take care of this, bro. John's famous temper? It was coming in hot. He stormed into the bar searching for Dre. When John asked if Dre always had that kind of attitude, Dre just shrugged and acted like nothing was wrong. But what really lit the fuse was Dre's bold claim that there wasn't a problem with him. It was John who had the issue. And then, the kicker, Dre told John Taffer to get out of his own rescue. Hey, what's wrong with your attitude? What's wrong with my attitude is you! No one talks to John Taffer like that and gets away with it. Things got heated fast, both of them trading insults and tension boiling over. Then, Dre did the unthinkable. He charged at John, ready to throw hands. It took a couple of people to physically pull Dre away before things went completely off the rails. That was the breaking point. You're hurting the owner at this bar. Dre, Dre. Dre's outburst was the last straw for John. He immediately demanded Tamika fire Dre on the spot, and to her credit, she did. But honestly, that was just a part of the problem. The entire bar was a disaster, from untrained staff to filthy conditions, and it was clear this place was on the brink. But don't think this is all. Buckle up for a bar rescue where all hell breaks loose in the most unexpected ways. If you thought Dre's meltdown was the peak, wait till you hear what went down at Zanzibar. When a desperate bar owner's last ditch effort to save his sinking ship turned into utter chaos, it set the stage for a head-to-head -head clash with John Taffer that no one saw coming. Respectful son of a bitch! Don't touch me! How dare you me! Zanzibar was the brainchild of Ami Benari, a guy who ran the bar like a general, but with a heart that initially seemed to be in the right place. Ami wasn't just another bar owner looking to hit it big, he was a man with a serious background. After his stint in the Israeli army, he packed his bags and headed to Denver, where he opened Zanzibar in 2009, ready to conquer the nightlife scene. In its early days, Zanzibar was on fire, pulling in around $38,000 a month, it was the place to be. But then, bam! life threw a massive curveball. In 2011, a near-fatal car accident put Ami out of commission, and that's when everything started to go south. Come on. With Ami off the scene, the staff went rogue, turning Zanzibar into a hot mess. Customers fled, and the once thriving bar began spiraling into chaos. By the time Ami returned, Zanzibar was bleeding money, losing up to $3,000 a month. Ouch! In a desperate bid to save his sinking ship, Ami decided to crack down on his staff with an iron fist. But here's where things went off the rails. He also started handing out free beer like it was Halloween candy. And if that wasn't bizarre enough, he even tried offering free foot massages and, wait for it, free sex. Yeah, not exactly a strategy for success. Crowd. Free beer, foot massage on the house, very cheap sex. Now, let's be honest, when the bar owner is out on the street handing out free drinks like he's hosting a charity gala, that's not exactly setting the best example. John Taffer, as you can imagine, wasn't impressed. Inside, things were spiraling into full-blown chaos. Picture this, a heavily inebriated customer, already swaying like a drunken lighthouse, was hitting on a woman at the bar as if he were the smoothest operator in town. And the bartenders? They just kept fueling his delusion by handing him yet another beer. Because sure, what could possibly go wrong with that approach? The kitchen, meanwhile, was a whole different level of disaster. The cook, who apparently doubled as the waiter, was supposed to be all about cleanliness. He wore a pair of gloves that you'd think would be a sign of sanitation vigilance. 
But nope, what John saw was downright insane. This cook wore those same gloves to handle food, serve it to customers, and even touch them directly. Then, he'd come back to the kitchen, clean the counters with those same gloves, and if that wasn't enough, he'd cough right into them before diving back into food prep. No washing, no changing, just straight up contamination city. John finally had it with his circus and stormed into the bar, ready to drop the hammer. He ripped into the staff for letting customers drink themselves into oblivion, so much so that they were practically crawling out the door. Ami's response? He took issue with John talking to his customers like that, suggesting if John wanted to help, he should tone it down. And the kitchen? John didn't mess around. He ordered every last thing to be chucked in the bin. Amy, in a last-ditch effort to maintain some semblance of control, declared that his cook, Dave, wouldn't leave until the kitchen was spotless enough to eat off the floor. Talk about going from bad to worse. The stress test that followed was a total disaster. Ami, rather than stepping up and taking charge, was running around like a headless chicken. John, seeing the chaos was unmanageable, decided to shut it down. What followed wasn't just a minor meltdown, it was a full-blown spectacle of dysfunction. Ami wasn't just angry, he was in complete denial, refusing to acknowledge the mess he had created. You're full of I have no idea what you're doing! First off to me, I'm busy! You've got to be kidding me! Then came the epic showdown. John, already at his wit's end with Ami's stubbornness, called a staff meeting to lay it all out. He told them Ami was the biggest disappointment. Ami's response? He claimed John hadn't helped him and had only created more mess, humiliating him in front of the customers. This did not sit well with John. He blasted Ami for focusing solely on his ego and his bizarre tactics, declaring that Ami was single-handedly responsible for the bar's downfall. The hole and got worse and worse by the minute. And as you're sinking, he's doing card tricks. But just when you thought it couldn't get crazier, Ami crossed the line. He blamed the kitchen disaster on Chef Duff and in a jaw-dropping move, called him Mr. Fat Boy. And not just once, but three times. John was stunned. After a brief pause, he lost it. He stormed at Ami, unleashing a torrent of frustration and called him a disrespectful son of a bitch, a sentiment many might agree with. Fat no. boy should have, yeah, fat boy. You should stop the kitchen long time ago. Things escalated quickly. Ami, not backing down, shoved John. But John wasn't having any of it. He shoved back and chaos erupted. After Amy's monumental meltdown, John decided enough was enough. He told the staff goodnight and stormed out, probably questioning if the rescue was even worth the hassle. Touch me! How dare you! How dare you touch me! And that's a wrap on the times John Taffer lost it on Bar Rescue. Which one of these made you jump out of your seats immediately? Make sure to let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the videos, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you want to keep the entertainment going, then don't forget to check out the next video right here. It's even crazier.